Good. So um, thank you for joining this, this session today. So I'm going to be talking to you about a project that I work on in Autodesk Research called Project Dasher. Um, and really, it's, it's our exploration into the use of digital twins in the AC space. You'll see some contact detail here. Um, this is my email it is at the end here. I'm on Twitter at KNW. You can also connect with me via LinkedIn. You can find me at KNW as well there, and also via my blog, KNW.com. Okay, a little bit about me. Um, I joined Autodesk 25 years ago, so I'm coming up on my 25th anniversary in a few weeks now, which is a little scary. But um, for the first 17 or so years with the company, I was part of the developer network team. So I had various roles um, going from you know, technically, or technically oriented roles as a developer support engineer and evangelist um, through to management roles in different ge geographies. Um, in 2012, I moved across into the AutoCAD team as a software architect, mainly focused on AutoCAD-based AutoCAD verticals. And then for the last four years, I've been in research. Um, I've also been around the world for Autodesk, literally. I started, started uh, in the UK, hence the accent, uh, moved to Switzerland first in 98, and then to the Bay Area in 2000 for three years, and then on to India, to, ba to Bangalore for two years after that. And then since 2006, I've been settled back in Switzerland, which is also when I started my blog through the interface, which you can find at kmw.com. It used to be um, related mostly around developing with the, auto with the .NET interface to AutoCAD, but these days, of course, as my job has evolved and my, my interests have changed, I've, I've focused to sort of start talking much more about developing with Forge and the sort of research projects that I'm involved in. So Dasha as a project started in 2009. So it's quite a long, you know, at the end of 2009, the, 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 the concept was put forward. And this is the first iteration of the, of the, of the tool, if you like, that was a desktop centric tool uh, that was quite, quite heavyweight, quite complicated to develop. Uh, you know, we had to have our own graphics engine. We, you know, we had to do our own IFC import. There's all sorts of stuff that we had to do to make it work. So it was, it was a relatively performant tool, but it wasn't something that was necessarily scalable and easy to deploy. Um, so it was, you know, but it was a very, very interesting first proof case of, of the, this kind of capability of taking, uh, taking IOT data or sensor data and integrating it into a 3D context. And that's really what Dasha has been about all along. Um, sort of skip forward to, you know, I want to say, well, when I joined the, joined the research team, of course, in 2016, one of my first projects was to get involved with Dasha and, and see if we could take what we'd done as a, as a core desktop tool and repurpose it and make use of it inside a, in, inside a web-based environment. So we went ahead and built out a version of Dasha that, that we've called Dasha 360, and you can check it out at dasha360.com. We'll take a look at that later anyway. Uh, but this is one of the, the early projects that was originally um, inside the Dasha desktop tool. And you can, it, you know, if you can use your imagination, this is actually the NASA logo that I've masked out down in the bottom there for, for copyright reasons. But so this is the floor of the Ames Research Building in, in California, I think it's the second floor. And here we have um, a heat map, animated heat map showing the temperature data for this particular floor of this building. And this is one of the early projects where we sort of started to see, oh, wow, there's really something here. As, as, we, as we showed it to the scientists at NASA, at NASA they identified a few things early on. First of all, that yes, this, this is meant to be a bit cooler than the rest of the building, this area in the center, because that's where the, 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 the servers are stored, you know, the data center. Um, but then they also noticed that this, this room at the bottom of this wing, um, as you can see in the corner here, they, they started to, to think about that. And then they realized, ah, the reason why that is so much cooler than the rest of the floor is that, that they've been doing a glaze, they were doing a glazing study. Um, on on that particular room, so they had some film on on the glasses to sort of shield for, for UV, uh, and so it was at the, only at that moment that because they hadn't yet crunched the numbers on on the actual data to say well how was it performing or how how was it changing things, so that was the first moment that we were thinking oh wow this is interesting that they're, they're, they're getting some insights here that they that they didn't they hadn't previously got um, and it was displayed in a way that made sense and was was easy to consume. Uh, the, the next um, interesting project that, that I think sort of really showed some p more, more interesting potential to correlate data was this one for Schneider Electric for their Greeno Valley building in their Grenoble campus in the south of France. And here you can see, you know, we, we're showing data from, from a, 
a, a new sensor of theirs that actually showed occupancy and positional data uh, for, the, for the people in the room. And we're able to overlay that with uh, CO2 data. So there you can see we've identified a, a hotspot where in a particular room we have a dozen or so people and you can see the CO2 levels represented by the heat map um, indicate a spike. And we can sort of slow it down, uh, change the speed settings, drill into the data and really understand a little bit more about what's happening to the point of even bringing up a chart that shows the, the, the readings from that particular CO2 sensor, at which point we can zoom all the way out and start to see, well, are we seeing a spike on a regular basis? Is this something that we need to, to essentially um, address via some change to the building management system, et cetera? You know, we're really debugging the building. That's ultimately what Dasher has been intended for, is a tool to explore and debug uh, your buildings. The, the, the next interesting project that I wanted to highlight was, was one that we did for a very specific purpose. So this is when we started to shift across to take a look at the potential for Dasher to deal with infrastructure. So in this case, we, we took our Pier 9 facility in San Francisco and we um, <clears throat> put a bunch of sensors onto this particular um, pedestrian walkway that goes across from one section of the Pier 9 facility to the other. Uh, so we, we put in a number of sensors, relate, so accelerometers, uh, strain gauges, but also we, we hooked up CCTV footage as well so that we could sort of pipe in the video to, in order to do once again this correlation between what we see in the sensor data and what we, what we see with people walking across it. So here you can see we've, we've, we've got the CCTV footage um, coming from this end of the, of the of the bridge and we can see a security guard walking across in the middle of the night and we can drill into the data and even get down to the point where we're analyzing the individual footfalls on the bridge and pulling that data out. Uh, interestingly, the bridge is also able, it's a smart bridge in, in that sense. It's been able to report things such as seismic events, uh, all sorts of, of things that might happen um, in, 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 the, in a broader context than just the building. It's, it, this is sort of what, what comes out in the data as well. Uh, what one issue with with working in this way and using CCTV footage was really around privacy. You know, we had to limit access of, that the people would have to to the system because they could have access to CCTV footage, and, and that clearly isn't something we wanted to to um, to enable for everybody. So in the end, we started to explore the potential for using computer vision techniques to extract meaningful information from the video footage and contextualize that in 3D, but then effectively anonymize the data. So we've, we've tried on different scales. Here's the Autodesk University exhibit floor in 2017, where we, we put up some cameras and started to uh, explore the, the, the data there. So my job in the Dasher team was to really sort of take that um, sensor data from the computer vision, pipe, vision pipeline that's been stored in our database and find a way to represent that in a 3D context, which we'll see more of. Now, um, this has really been about uh, this one particular project that we've been working, with, working on uh, with the MX3D um, team in the Netherlands. So this is the world's first, the, the concept behind this was it would be the, the world's first uh, robotically 3D printed steel bridge. Uh, the, the initial con concept was that we'd have, um, you know, welding robots essentially building their way across a canal in, in Amsterdam. Now, in reality, of course, you can't really have unattended um, welding robots uh, in, a, in one of the busiest parts of the city. So um, what happened was that, that of course, the, the actual manufacture was done offline in a, in a, in a warehouse, at the N NDSM wharf in, in Amsterdam. Now, of course, the actual design of the building was, sorry, the design of the bridge changed as well. It's still generatively designed. That was one, one key aspect of it, but it was, you know, using a, a somewhat different approach. Um, it was also not, done, you know, not printed by robots go, you know, moving across the bridge. That, that's clearly something, you know, that, that, that was aspirational rather than being, re being realistic for this, for this one particular project. But here you can see the more or less finished bridge uh, where we went in late in 2018 and we were, we were working on, on integrating sensors and we did a quick stress test by having everybody jump up and down. Um, luckily, you know, nothing, nothing went wrong there. We also had already put like a few 
I think there'd been 20 tons of water had been put you know, on the bridge as a, as a load test prior to that. So we weren't too worried about the risk of it, of it falling. Um, here, here's the bridge itself with a number of sensors that have been placed inside it. So we can go through and see, um, you, know, as, you know, this is the, the, the classic Dasher interface, which I'll, I'll go into in a bit more depth in a, in a little while. But here we're, we're going through and navigating to different views of the bridge and taking a look at the sensors in 3D. We're also able to sort of pull up this skeleton data uh, that we captured from the computer vision pipeline and play it. And once again, this is about correlating the data with, um, you know, between the, the stress data that we're collecting for the bridge alongside the, the information we have about people crossing, crossing the bridge. Uh, now this was really done. So th this is another view where we're actually able to sort of um, take a look at that skeleton data alongside the, the camera footage for really for debugging purposes. In the end, of course, the, the camera footage will be thrown away. One of the reasons for this is, of course, the bridge is going to be placed in the red light district of Amsterdam. So privacy is uh, sort of a major concern for, for this. So here we can see we're able to sort of correlate the, the, the video footage with what we're seeing in the, in the skeleton representation. And once again, you know, this is a, another kind of close up of that view that we saw before where we're taking a look at this idea of correlating uh, you know the information we have about people flow alongside what the bridge is reporting in terms of uh, you know movement uh, whether it's strain or acceleration this is before we had calibrated data coming from the sensors so it's not very representative it was more of a test uh, but but the bridge itself is being placed um, in Amsterdam in the coming weeks in fact sometime in August I think it's finally going to be placed uh, at which point we'll, we'll start to get real data coming off it. So that was um, our sort of foray into the, or ex exploration in terms of um, <clears throat> the use of, of Dasha for infrastructure beyond buildings, but we hadn't given up on buildings. So we're still very much involved in, in projects related to using Dasha um, in the building context. And, and this is a project that we engaged on with um, EMPA, so that the Swiss, um, material science agency uh, and the project is called nest and it's a it's a it's a very interesting building just on the the outskirts of zurich in dubendorf where there are really um, a number of of uh, collaborators including eth zurich are exploring the the potential for digital fabrication in in the building context so it's it's really a, a showcase for a number of of very interesting techniques. They have sort of 3D printed walls. Um, they have 3D printed, you know, ceilings. They have um, <clears throat> um, an urban mining and recycling unit in the center here where, where pretty much everything has a material passport and has been reclaimed from, um, you know, pre sort of previous sites and previous projects and expects to be re completely recycled at the end as well. Uh, so, so it's a very, very interesting um, project. And one of the good things about it is they had upwards of 2000 sensors in the in the project already uh, before we even connected Dasha to it. So we had a wealth of data to to connect to and to visualize inside Dasha, which made it very compelling. So for us, we were just able to copy across large amounts of data that they'd already been capturing historically and then connected in to Dasha. Um, th th this is what we're seeing here is the nest building that's been and, and this is kind of being um, animated or being displayed using the, the um, kiosk mode capability. So, so if you look at this, this button in the bottom left of the, in, in the left hand toolbar, this, is, this kind of runs a, an automated mode, which we call kiosk mode. The idea being that it may be put inside a kiosk of some sort at a you know, trade show or in the, in the lobby of a building, but allowing people to, to see a sort of scripted demo uh, which can be interrupted at any time just by moving the mouse or touching the screen if it's a touch screen uh, at which point the the user can essentially start to interact with the model at that point so i'll, I'll show how this you know I'll show this working um in the browser in a minute but you can also go to dasha360.com click on demo and then click on the kiosk mode button and then sit back and and, and see see what it does essentially um, so here's another view which is just sort of animating a number of different sensors being you know data coming from a number of different sensors at the same time um, 
you, you can see a, a key point of Dasher is that we, it's, its main focus is really about exploration of historical data. We are able to show real-time values, but it's really intended for exploring historical data and essentially debugging your, your buildings. Um, so what we have here is, you know, so here we have a, a four day period selected in the timeline and, and it's just looping, looping through. And as, as it loops through, we can see, you know, temperature data for this, for this area of the floor. Um, we can see animated tool tips showing data for a particular equipment sensor. We have um, a dashboard with other interest, you know, sensors that we've, we've pinned inside the dashboard. And inside the sensor list itself, you can see um, that this particular, you know, th these values should correspond to this sensor because that's the one that's highlighted. Um, okay, so that's, um, I think, what I wanted to really show for the, for the, for the presentation. And this is another project that we've been working on with, with Kingspan in Ireland. Um, and, and, and this is an interesting one in the sense we've been uh, really sort of take going to the next level in terms of trying to integrate uh, much more detailed information about mechanical systems, for example, you know, an integrated disability to show sort of x-ray information coming through from the through through from forge uh, related to different layers in the inside the building. Uh, so that's been quite interesting. It's also the first uh, the first office environment that we've integrated our computer vision pipeline for um, to, to be able to detect people moving through the space. So that's another interesting aspect to, to what we've been doing for doing with Kingspan in Ireland. I probably think, yeah, so I, I will talk about this slightly um, or quickly before I sort of switch, switch gears. Uh, this is the end of my deck. I'll, I'll do some you know, we can go in and take a look at some features inside Dasher that we've been working on more recently. But this is uh, an, an interesting image that I think to some degree shows where in the long run we see uh, the Internet of Things and a tool such as Dasher feeding into a, a larger ecosystem of tools. So you can think of, of Dasher as living in this space here where we're monitoring um, real world performance of an object, in this case a building. and Eventually, you know, we're, we're, at the moment we're, we're using it more as an exploration tool in 3D. In, in the long run, this data can be used in lots of different ways, whether it's using machine learning to start to identify uh, or to, to, you know, which is trained against uh, anomalous situa or situations that occur on a regular basis. So you can provide more meaningful alerts about what's happening in your building. And, and Dash will also always be a tool that could allow you to explore the, you know, um, situations that you haven't necessarily trained your system for but also this data increasingly is going to be fed back into the generative design loop where we're able to take real world performance data and use it to more effectively design the next iteration of that particular object whether it's a building or a car or a bridge so rather than than um, taking theoretical data or you know sort of anticipating certain loads and probably over engineering um you know objects or you know uh, the built environment we can we can essentially start to to more optimally build or, or explore the potential solution space uh during the design process based on real world data so generate evaluate evolve is kind of the classic generative design loop um, which of course then feeds through into the different aspects in this in this uh, in this process. So let's um, switch across to a browser. Actually, you know what I'll do in the meantime. I just quickly go to the Q and A tab. Um, okay, all right. So there's a, qu a question from my colleague Michael Beale related to. Um, gathering skeleton data. Ultimately, um, you know, so the question that he's asked was related to the use of depth sem sensors, you know, such as Connect or what have you to, to extract uh, 3D sensor data and uh, skeleton data rather than using RGB cameras. Um, in, in our case, it's most, sorry, rather than, yeah, rather than using RGB cameras. The, the reason we haven't so far is really just in terms of um, I, I would say a few things. I would say um, the cost associated with deploying depth cameras is still a little bit prohibitive. And in, in this case, it typically allows us to feed into 
existing infrastructure that, that's, collect, that's, that's capturing footage. So that's been the main purpose. Also a range thing as well, to some degree. Um, we, can, we, we have a, you know, better results with the visual range from RGB, you know, RGB cameras rather than RGBD cameras. Um, but yeah, most of our pipeline at the moment is focused on, on images rather than depth. Okay, so let's um, pull up Dasha. And I'll just uh, broaden this out a little bit. And I'll show some of the more recent um, capabilities that may be of interest to people who are thinking of developing something similar um, using Forge. So one of, the, one of the workflows that we've been sort of exploring a little bit more is this idea of being able to embed Dasher inside other systems. Um, so you may have uh, a broader system that is that is analyzing sensor data and, and, and identifying anomalous situations, at which point uh, you may want to just have a link that allows you to click on um, the link and launch Dasher and really explore the data at that moment. So it's really about allowing you to say, well, this is the area of interest. You as a human should go in and identify, you know, will validate what's happening or help us clarify our understanding of the problem with the building. Uh, so we wanted to be able to have kind of an API that, that essentially allows you to uh, in either embed Dasha with, with URL parameters and control it that way or provide a link to somebody. And this could also be done in a sharing context. So let's take a look at it in this. I've just got to get it, get away from my nest, sorry, my nest, my um, zoom toolbar to get that out of the way so I can actually interact with the navigation. So here I'm going to um, go ahead and go, well, actually let's turn the sensor dots on first. So here, um, as I go down through the navigation, I can see most of most of my interesting sensors are on the first floor. So we can take that and spin that around and let's go into a very specific area of the building and get in nice and close. Um, at which point, you know, we can also do things like sort of turn off the textures and turn on surface shading. Um, maybe let's not look at temperature. We can look at CO2, for example. Um, we can change the play speed uh, on the timeline and hit, uh, hit play. And we can start to see, you know, essentially the CO2 levels for this floor um, being, being represented. We can also bring up some data that, that may be of interest. So let's take a look at the CO2. Let's, let's see how it can compare CO2. We can compare it with humidity. And in this case, we're just going to sort of cycle through. This is a slightly different mode. One thing you, you would have seen before is that uh, we have a couple of modes for showing the data and I'll, and I'll show you what, what, what I mean there. So if we go to the appearance tab, um, if I toggle this off, then you'll see that rather than having the, 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 the data fixed and then the, the timeline essentially or the, you know, the, this red bar moving across, this is actually just sort of uh, moving the data. So it's really up to you. There's a choice there in terms of which way you display it. This is a little bit more consistent with the representation in the timeline, but it's a little bit less cool, I would say. Um, you also got some time zone settings. We can change the visual, visual, uh, visual style as well. If we want to go to a slightly different view, I can put it to, dark blue as well. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so once we've got the, this happening, if I were to share this particular view with somebody else who's perhaps on the other side of the planet, um, I can pull up the sharing dialogue. So if I click on this feature, it brings up the sharing dialogue. Now, it, it, don't worry too much about this. It's a little bit complicated, but essentially it's being populated based on the data the, or the, the current view. So it's, there's a particular sensor that, I've, that, I've, um, that I have uh, brought up a plot for. You can see that this ID matches this ID, but of course I can go and select one of the other sensors that are, that are in here as well. Um, because this sensor is on the first floor, it's decided that the level is just auto, but if I wanted to specifically choose it to be something else, I could change it and it would be it would be changed inside the, the URL parameter. Um, again, the CO2 surface shading, I could change to, to be something else, humidity, presence, temperature. Um, this, is, this timeline setting is, is de derived from the, 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 the current time selection in the timeline. So, you know, we could, we could change it, 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 it in the timeline itself, or we could change it here, it doesn't really matter. Um, 
And I could show, so one other thing that I would show is rather than, than um, so what I can do is if I toggle this current view option, it's going to take the current view position and target, encode it um, inside another URL parameter called view and pass that in as well. Um, so what this is going to do is give a much more exact representation of the view that we have at the moment. And what you end up with, all the changes that you're making here, and you can see as I change things here, it's going to change um, this URL. All this is doing is really helping build a URL, um, which I can just, I just click on, click on copy to clipboard. Um, and if I then go and open up a new browser window and paste that in, all being well, it's going to basically show an identical view to the one that I've just set up inside, inside the browser, um, allowing somebody else to see exactly what I've been seeing inside Dasher and, and perhaps comment on, on, on what they've seen. Um, you know, do, do they see the same thing? Is there, is there something else they want to, uh, or, you know, is, is there something to discuss there? So that's the, the sharing and the equivalent kind of API capability that we have inside Dasher. If you go to dasher360.com, you can play with it yourself and see exactly how it works. I think this, um, this uh, URL building feature or sharing feature is, is just a way to help you understand this API, if you want to call it an API. Um, but it's, it's, you know, you could also handcraft this, this, URL as well, or have it built from an external system, which is, you know, perhaps, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, monitoring sensor feeds and, and, you know, identifying anomalous situations. Okay. So um, if you want to try Dasher yourself, once again, bring up, go to dasher360.com and I'll show you what to do just to, you go to dasher360.com and you can just click on click on demo and that's that it'll bring up this 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 view and once again you know once once you you sort of have it up uh, feel you know the best thing to do really is just to click on kiosk mode and then and then sit back and enjoy and then if you want to start to interact with uh, dasher then you can just move your mouse and and, ex and explore it that way Okay, um, how are we doing for time? I see we're about 30 minutes in, which is pretty much exactly what I wanted. Um, so Damon, is it a good time to open up for any questions? Okay, I see there's a couple more questions come in via the Q&A uh, tab. So what I'll, what I'll do, so the first question there that, that came in was from Brett, Brett Young. Hi, Brett, nice to hear from you. So lots of people and companies are interested in people movement. Do you anticipate Autodesk providing users with a people movement computer vision pipeline? That's a really good question. So um, certainly the, the work that we're doing with computer vision and analyzing uh, video, video feeds in particular is, is ongoing. It's still inside research. It's still a little complicated to calibrate for each project. It's not something that's just out of the box. So that is um, something, so I'll click on answer live. So that is something that, 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 um, that is, I, I, you know, I can't predict whether it would be productized. It, it seems a little messy and complicated at the moment in order, you know, for that to actually be easy to do. But um, I'd certainly like to see its use being uh, expanded. And I'm not sure whether that's within whether it, you know, I, I'm not sure how long it would need to stay in research before it's something that was sufficiently simple to be productized, but it's, a, it's certainly something that we're continuing to work on. So the next question is from, from Vinu, uh, and it's related to how is Dasher different from Forge? Really, it, it, I would say that 90, uh, well, it's hard to say exactly how much, but say, let's say 90% of Dasher is written using, for the, using Forge. So we, we develop it using the Forge viewer, uh, so this is really the Forge Viewer. The time, like the 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 um, sorry, the the toolbar here is very familiar to people who are using Forge already. We've added our own toolbar here with our own capabilities as well as some navigation capabilities, um, <clears throat> and and the timeline. Now the the big difference with our um, let's say with between what we've done in Dasher and what's available directly in Forge is really around the time series database. So we have our own time series data that stores all this sensor 
data. So let's just bring up a particular sensor. And one of the reasons why we have our own um, sensor backend or time series infrastructure is it allows us to sort of take um, uh, a whole load of sensor data and rather than querying it at, 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 at runtime and essentially summarizing it that way, we have different levels of detail, which just gives you this really responsive um, mechanism that allows you to sort of zoom in a bit like with Google Maps, where it's tiling in different levels of detail, depending on, on how close you get to the data. So this is um, allowing really us to go into the raw data or zoom all the way back and take a look at it for months or even years at a time without querying the raw, the raw data. So that's really been an intention to give us that, that, um, that core, uh, you know, that, that core UX experience or user experience. So I would say that, that uh, that is a, a service that is not part of Forge, but everything else that we've used um, is pretty much part of Forge today. Um, and I, will, I, I, would, I, mean, I would expect to see an increasing amount of what we've done inside Dasher made available through the Forge platform as well to make it easier for people to build similar tools. Um, so that I think I hopefully have answered. The data, so a question from Samuel, the data collected to the sensors, does it sync automatically? So there's nothing very automatic about that in the sense, you know, you have to have your sensors that you have to have a way to get at your sensor data and feed it into your time series database. So we've used a number of mechanisms for that, whether it's querying the building management system, whether it's having our, um, you know, using BACnet, et cetera, et cetera, or, or using our own um, sensor infrastructure that, that is, you know, feeding data via, via a Raspberry Pi based tool to, to that, that would then calls an API to plug our data into the, the back end. Um, we also could, the example with Nest is they'd, they'd gone through all the work of collecting all their data. So we just have a conduit that copies the data across from their system into ours um, to avoid us having to connect to theirs directly. Uh, so that's another approach that we have, but there's nothing at the moment. It's not automatic. It's not a simple um, mechanism. You use, you know, most projects have to be attacked, you know, uh, addressed uh, from, you know, uh, fresh, I suppose. We, we learn from each one, but it, but it's, it's, we don't currently have smart buildings that are just automatically collecting data and we can just plug Dasher into because that would be the ideal situation. But unfortunately, I haven't come across any of those yet. Um, can I demonstrate, so another question from Vinu, can I demonstrate generative design using Dasher? Well, we don't, Dasher doesn't actually do generative design. It's just about exploring data that could be used um, in a generative design process. So if you want to use, use implement generative design, then that's a different question. That's more using Dynamo and, and Refinery or, or Revit 2021 to implement generative workflows, which is also something that I do, but it's not really the, the, the topic of today's call, uh, um, today's session, unfortunately. So a question from Sheridan, um, can you integrate and simulate sunshine data from Unreal with indoor temperatures? So we're not using, um, un, I mean, we're not using Unreal, but we, you know, we're using obviously Forge, which is WebGL based and browser based. Now in theory, if you, you could build a digital twin using Unreal for your visualization and then, you know, take, take things in there directly. Um, but, that, but that's not really uh, something that we have done or are doing with Dasher. Um, and then Samuel asks another question. In your experience, what kind of data have you collected? What about the wildlife in the building surround? So that's interesting. So we haven't yet done um, skeletonization of, of animals other than humans, which would be kind of interesting. Um, we are able to pretty much, you know, display, well, we're able to, to display lots of different kinds of data. I mean, just in the nest building, we can take a look at some of the, the, the sensors that we have. Um, here, for example, we have, you know, air quality, thermostats, batteries, um, heat pumps, power sensors, current, you know, presence sensors to say, well, what, you know, where people have been inside the building. So really Dasher is able to be configured to work with any kind of time series data because ultimately a time, time series um, database just stores a timestamp with a, a double value or even a, you know, it could be a string or something else, but typically it's, it's a double. Uh, so a number 
and and really it doesn't matter too much what the data is it's you know that that's a um it's, it's not a problem for us to visualize it i would say okay all right um that's the i think those are the questions that i have so far does anybody have any other questions i i have a question but i can't type it in uh from where well, i'm coming can, from. you can just ask me like that Damon. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, I've noticed that you've, you've shown some buildings that are uh, rather sensitive in nature as far as who can access them and, and be able to uh, pull up the, the data from them. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you recommend as far as a secure way that people need to look at building applications with Dasher, um, you know, since, since that is the case, right? You know, this is web-based and things like that. Uh, right. what, what are just some elements of, of security uh, that, that folks should think of when, when again, doing bi-directional control or just pulling in uh, historical or real-time data? Yeah, so, um, well, the way that we just, just, you know, so I don't know if this is, and it probably is not best practice at all, but I mean, I can describe what we've done around security inside Dasher, which is not very much, which is also another reason why we haven't done bi-directional in terms of modifying the building management system and changing thermostats and things like that directly from Dasher, because that would mean a level of detail above what, a level of, of security above what we've implemented. But in terms of access to models, et cetera, I mean, we have this capability here that you essentially can log in to Dasher and pull up your, your projects. Um, now those are stored inside BIM 360. Um, so you have all the permissions that have been set up based on your, you know, BIM 360 user um, credentials. We then, of course, also have credentials on the time series database. So typically for people to be able to access the data, uh, you know, when it's shared as a public demo, we have a separate pipeline for that. But for people who are logged in and looking at more sensitive data, they also have to have privileges on the time series database as well, which is a bit of an issue in the sense there's a scalability problem there because whenever we want to add users, we have to make sure they're added in both places. But this is something that's going to become streamlined over time, I guess, as we get better, you know, better systems, um, better tooling. But for the moment, yes, we, we have security on the time series side and then also on the forge side of things as well to make sure that that people are only able to access um, what, you know, what they should have access to. Now, and back to the question, it's not really what you asked, but there is a kind of a question that's implicit in there, which is how could you use Dasher on your own buildings? And of course, the, unfortunately, the answer today is you can't unless you, you know, it's, it's part of a research pilot that, that I'm involved or we're involved with, because um, it is still very much a research project. We, we're aiming to get more of it available to people in some fashion, um, whether through the Forge platform or otherwise, but it's not something that is really simple, to, as simple as, as saying, well, let's just take a, a Revit model and get it working inside Dasher because there are so many moving parts. You know, you've got to have hard, sensor hardware, a sensor data, you know, time series database that's collecting the data and have that all plugged in into Dasher. It's not a, um, uh, a plug and play experience today, unfortunately. So it's, it's still a little bit messy, which is why it's in research. So, so what kind of um, projects then if, uh, do you welcome as far as collaboration on research then? Who, who are the types of people that should reach out to you uh, if interested in this? That's a really good question. Uh, well, we don't have a very big team um, working on, on Dasher. In fact, uh, at the moment, you're kind of speaking to almost all of it. Um, <laughs> So, you know, we have a, you know, in that sense, we, we don't have a great deal of bandwidth. I mean, the, the ideal pilot is, is something that is easy for us to implement, but explores something new, all right? So that, that, which is just kind of, you know, you can imagine the Venn diagram. <laughs> um, there's not much in the intersection there in the sense that, you know, we, we, it would need, ideally it would be something that's relatively simple. There'd be a high quality um, as built BIM, with sensors modeled in the, with their their actual locations inside the the 3D model, um, there would be uh, in the best case, which was this pretty much the situation with Nest, is that they would have a um, an existing time series database with all their sensor data that we can just copy the data across from without having to 
um, put sensors into the building, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so those are the kind of um, baseline requirements. I, I would say to get moving quickly, but there's still quite a lot of work that's needed to do things such as um, getting the navigation set up, getting the right sensors configured. Um, you know, they're, they're, it, it's still a relatively complicated thing. So we're not really seeking um, additional pilot projects, but I'm always happy to talk to people about where we are and what the possibilities are. Um, so I can't promise that I'll be able to get on a call with you, but you should definitely feel like, you know, feel free to reach out to me through email or LinkedIn um, if you'd like to discuss possibilities. Now, um, Samuel has answered, asked another question. How do you imagine using this data for generative design in three years from now? So I think there's a few, a few ways that are being actively explored. I think right now, um, the, the, the there's a great deal of potential to have the data that's, that's captured from a particular building uh, train some sort of machine learning um, system, neural network, what have you, and, and then have that involved in, in the, the generative design process. So you could have the dynamo graph querying data directly from um, that neural network in order to answer certain questions that would then you know, lead to the design being configured based on the data that's coming in. I think that's probably a, a relatively near term way of, of addressing that particular problem. So within the three year time frame, I think that would be realistic. Uh, you could, of course, have different ways of query, you know, querying the data more directly, but I think really via a, um, some sort of um, machine learning approach. I, again, I don't want to say AI, but yes, AI, uh, where you're, you're really uh, training that system based on real world performance data, and then that is participating in the design process. I think that's probably the most realistic way for, for us to see that happen. 